Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you, it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, would you give the Lord a big hand clap of praise? He is worthy of it. He is so worthy of it. Amen. Praise God. I had a nice little coat to wear. I just didn't feel like putting it on. I hope I don't, um, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> I figure it's like Memorial Day weekend. Everybody ought to be kind of chilled down a little bit anyway. So you can be seated. Let's get ready to dive into this thing, and you're going to be so blessed today. Take your pads out. Listen with me today. Really focus on hearing. I believe in God that you are anointed to hear. And when you're anointed to hear, you're going to be anointed to receive. But this is a, a turning point message in your life. It is going to, in essence, attack some of the things that we have all learned. Uh, I'll be testifying about some of the things that I have taught that I had to change as a result of understanding this gospel of grace. Let's begin here in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. We're continuing in the series, How Grace Teaches Us Godliness. How Grace Teaches Us Godliness. We know that ungodliness is a total disregard of God, and basically it's uh, to be ungodly is more than just the, wicked, the wickedness that we list in, uh, in our list, but to be ungodly is a person who neglects God. They disregard God. They don't even think it's necessary to ask for God to bless a thing anymore. That is ungodly. Uh, and the Bible says the grace of God will teach us to refuse that. But godliness is the opposite. Godliness is to, to have a regard for God. But at the very base of this, the very base of a godly lifestyle, is a voluntary submission to live a life that's dependent upon God. A voluntary uh, submission to live a life totally dependent upon God. And that's something as Christians that we have to learn how to do in order to allow grace to teach us godliness. So let's look at this scripture in verse 11, Titus chapter 2. Let's just review just a little bit. Verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all man. So the grace of God that brings salvation appears to all man. So just so you can get a mental picture, Jesus is grace. The Bible says Jesus, full of grace and truth. Now, now look at this progression. Here is Jesus first, and out of Jesus comes grace, and out of grace comes truth. They're all the same, but ultimately, Grace is not a curriculum or a subject matter. Grace is a person. His name is Jesus. And grace comes as a result of Jesus, and truth comes as a result of grace. So you can't just preach anything and call it truth. So in the New Testament, when the Bible makes reference to truth, he's making reference to grace. He's making reference to, to Jesus. Jesus, the way, the truth, you see. And so we've got to start kind of identifying these terms so we can follow along with what he's trying to show us in the New Testament. He says, for the grace of God, it brings salvation, and it's been made available to every man on the planet. Everybody that's alive had the same opportunity as you and I had. They have an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of their lives, receive him as Lord, personal Savior, and to get born again. Everybody on the planet had that opportunity. Now, you hopefully have taken advantage of that opportunity and said, yes, I believe and I receive Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. But this grace, this opportunity to be saved, then you didn't deserve it. It was made available to the whole world. Now, look at verse 12. He says, now, this grace teaches us. So this is amazing. Grace, Jesus, grace teaches us. Teaches who? Teaches us who, watch this, teaches us who have received him. It, te it doesn't teach those who hadn't received him. Grace was made available to them, but they didn't receive. 
And because they didn't receive, then grace doesn't teach them. So grace teaches us. Somebody say, grace is teaching me right now. Grace, I mean, it, it, he's accepted the responsibility to teach all of those who believe and all of those who have received him. Grace teaches us. Well, what is he going to teach us? He's going to teach us to deny. That word deny means refuse. He teaches us that, that denying ungodliness, we're going to refuse ungodliness, which means we're going to refuse this life of disregarding God. We're going to refuse this life of neglecting God. We're going to refuse to live a life without having God in that life, okay? It's going to also teach us to refuse worldly lust. It's going to teach us to get us to the point where we are not going to allow worldly lust is all about those inside cravings and desires that are valued greater than God. Those inside cravings or desires that you value greater than God. See, I can't necessarily look at you in your life and see all of the worldly lustful things that you do because some of it is in hiding. It's hiding in your heart. It's a craving that I might not be able to see. It is a desire that I might not be able to see. But we, I want to make sure you understand that if you have a desire to value something in this world greater than God, then that is worldly lust, okay? He says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, he said that we should be sober, live soberly, live righteously, and here's where we are, that he wants to teach us to live godly in this present world. And while grace, while Jesus is teaching us, notice what he said to do in verse 13. He says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So while grace is teaching us, we're looking for the return of the Lord. Now, things are getting crazy every day. And you think it's getting crazy with the shootings and all of that. That's not the end of this. It's going to get t more. It, you're going to see stuff that's going to just blow your mind. You're just like, this is, this is, this is crazy. And it's going to get more crazy, okay? The only thing that's going to stop the progression of the craziness that this world is about to see, watch this, is the rapture of the church. The rapture is going to interrupt all of this stuff that's going on right now. And uh, we are, we who have believed are in the process of allowing Jesus to, to put the final touches on our lives, the finished works on our life. Amen. So I'm not just reading to you. I'm not just telling you this. You better open yourself up and get ready. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ is at hand. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise first, and those of you who are alive and remain shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and you shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and there shall you forever be with the Lord. He says, you start looking for that because that's about to happen. Systems are going to fail, and they're not going to recover like they used to recover. They're not going to rebound like they used to rebound. There are certain lies that are told, and then all of a sudden, one day, you're going to realize you been lied to. You better let the Holy Ghost teach you how to live a godly life. Are you listening to me now? All right, so let's define godliness once again. Godliness, it means to have regard for God, and it includes voluntary dependence upon Him. Godliness is all about voluntary dependence upon Him. A godly life is, is going to be, for example, it's going to be free from doubt as to his wisdom, doubt as to his love, doubt as to his goodness, doubt as to his provision. You're going to depend on him and you're going to totally trust and believe him where his wisdom is com concerned, his love, his goodness, his provision. Listen to this very carefully. Dependence upon God excludes all dependence upon self. Dependence upon God excludes all dependence upon self. So grace is trying to teach us to depend upon God and stop depending on you. Because you're going to find out some of the stuff even you depended on, you depend on that you could be able to do this stuff, it, it's not going to be like that no more. All of us will be put in positions where you won't be able to fix it, but God can. And I don't want you to wait until the last minute to work on and start practicing depending on God. 
you need to depend on God and start depending on Him, R-A-T, right now, quick as a rat. You need to do it right now. Amen? Opportunities to depend upon God. And then every child of God should exercise unfailing dependence, if we're talking about ungodliness. Our dependence upon God should be dependent on God where His power and His love is expressed through grace. So I depend on God's power, the ability to get the job done. I depend on God's love for me. I know God loves me. I know God loves me. I know God loves me. My faith rests in the love of God. I know God loves me, therefore what He promised me will come to pass. I know God loves me, therefore I'm healed. I know God loves me, therefore I'm delivered. I know God loves me, and even if you don't get the answer right away, you still got to know God loves you and He's working something out. Right? All right? Now, it is so important to recognize that godly living includes this unfailing dependence upon the grace of God. I want you to hear it over and over again. Godly living is all about this unfailing dependence upon the grace of God. The believer in Christ cannot be said to be living a truly godly life until he is brought to a place where he bows his head, he bows his heart to the grace of God. So the humble attitude here of complete dependence upon God, this attitude will express itself in voluntary submission to God's will, and you will submit yourself to this little wonderful scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 31, where it says, do all things to the glory of God. Do all things to the glory of God will become the rule for your life, as grace teaches you about godliness. It'll eventually come to the place, do all things to the glory of God. Now, here's what I'm going to show you this morning, is that when you make a decision to live a life of dependence upon God, you are giving God glory. That's how you give God glory, by depending on Him. I don't know how we've defined it in the past, but you give God glory by, by uh, exhibiting your dependence on Him. And every time you wake up and you decide to live a life dependent on God, at the same time, simultaneously, you are giving Him the glory. You say, somebody says, well, what you going to do about this? Well, I'm just relying on Jesus. You just gave God the glory. Well, what you going to do about that? Well, I'm just depending on God. You just gave God the glory. God's trying to show you that He doesn't need you to change somebody's life. He can do that on His, on his own. We, sometimes I think we think God's more dependent on us than we should on Him. Amen? And so this, this becomes pretty vital in, in, in what, we're, what we're trying to do. So, the world's religions, for example, let me give an illustration on, on how thick I think this is today. The world's religions, they all have moral codes. You, pick a religion, they all have a moral code. They have some moral rules and standards that they expect you to live by. But even if you conform to it, it would not be called godly living because you decided to conform to some godly ways of living. Why? Because godly living is dependent on God. Your conformity to a rule doesn't make it godly. You may conform to something that looks godly, but con to conform to something that even looks godly, but it doesn't depend on God, God doesn't depend on God, it's not godly. Even if you, let's take, for example, the golden rule or uh, the Mosaic law, and, you know, you have conformity to the golden rule or to the Mosaic law, you know, it would be godly living only if it could be in full dependence upon God, only if you're dependent on God to help you with the, with the golden rule or help you with the Mosaic law, and it's done to His glory. See, we got this thing called, you know, this pious, devout religious living. Some religions have these pious, devout living. However, self-sacrificing is not necessarily godliness. Why is it dependent on God? Self-sacrificing is not, not necessarily godliness if it's not dependent on God. Now, let me give you an illustration for the church and, and, and our community today. Godly living is not mere service for others, because we come to church and, and we think that's the thing we should do. And it is good. It has value 
temporarily. But God wants to move us out of the temporarily. He wants us to get into some eternal things. Godly living is not mere service for others. The present day social service programs, uh, being neighborly, the things that we do, uh, the goodwill of many churches that we show. Our church, for example, we are feeding people, what, twice a week. I mean, that's cool, but if we're not depending on God to do it, it's not godliness. Oh, we got people and we put them all in hotels. Oh, that's good, but if it's not done dependent on God, it's not godliness. And what the church has done is we do stuff to make us look godly, but we're not dependent on God for what we're doing. Y'all, y'all, I'm going to keep nailing it in. We, 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 we do this. You know, in, in some church, churches, you can have a bunch of hellions out there passing food out. And they're not dependent on God. It's the thing they do probably to make them feel pretty good about themselves. If not in dependence upon God, it's not for His glory. It may have temporary value. Yeah, the food we give out, it may have temporary value until the next week and the next week and the next week. But now what happens when the church is not dependent on God to keep the food going and the people that are come getting the food are not dependent on God to have the food? And that whole system is shut down. And you still don't know how to depend on God. It had temporary value until we recognized that your roots were messed up and you were not dependent on God. You were dependent on the church to have it. No, 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 no. The church ain't God. The past ain't God. You got to learn how to depend on God for yourself. That's what grace wants to teach you. He wants to teach you godliness and how to depend on God. Now, I'm about to enter into something that has probably taken 41 years for me to figure out how to articulate it. And I, I need you to hear it. I really thank God for this church. I thank God that you're students of grace. I thank God that you sit, you know how to sit, you know how to listen, you, you know how to, you know, you know how to eat dinner, you know how to eat just food. Um, and maybe I might not get it right as far as how to articulate it today, but I, I think it's time for me to attempt to, to do this. Now there are five ways, we probably won't cover them all today, but the believer's life that should be in complete dependence upon God is taught in many different ways throughout the Scripture, and, and we may not have recognized it. But there are five different subjects that are taught in the Bible that have been designed to teach the believer complete dependence. I want to look at the first one. The complete dependence upon God is taught through, here's the first one, through the teachings of faith through the teachings of faith. Faith is a teaching that is supposed to teach the believer, the believer about complete dependence upon God. Now, let me show you these three scriptures. We're just going to read them. You're probably going to interpret them as you have always in your past. And then I'm going to become an enemy to those three scriptures. But let's read them. Uh, first of all, the first scripture, Hebrews chapter 10, 38, Hebrews 11 and 6, and Romans 14, 23. Let's go to Hebrews 10, 38. I, I'm going to show you that, oh man, why it's so important to get this thing in context, because grace was supposed to be the teacher of complete dependence upon God. And I don't know if that happened. Let's see. Now the just shall live by faith. Yeah, he's supposed to be living by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Okay, so the question is, okay, so how was this supposed to teach me about complete dependence upon God? All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and 6. Setting it up now. Hebrews chapter 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Well, I know God is pleased when we live a life of godliness and we're in complete dependence upon God. But how does this uh, accomplish that? For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He rewards those that diligently seek him. 
All right, let's go to Romans 14 and 23. Romans 14 and 23. See, it's easy for you to read this and define these scriptures based on what you have learned about faith in the past. And I'm telling you, you've got to ask yourself, even based on what you've learned in the past, how does that teach me complete dependence upon God, and how does it teach me godliness? Verse 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. All right, so now right now, ladies and gentlemen, it's obvious that an understanding of the word of faith is needed to bring out the full meaning of these scriptures. And so, I, I don't know how, I don't even know how I missed this in my teaching of faith. I, I have got to give you an understanding of the word of faith. If I don't give you an understanding of the word of faith, you will continue to look at these scriptures, and I guarantee you it's not going to be teaching you complete dependence on God. Somehow you'll come out having more dependence on what you can do. You follow me? Now, let's go to the book of uh, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse uh, 18 through 21. I want to read it in the King James and then in NLT, because one of the clearest explanations of faith is found in Romans 4, 18 and 21. I mean, we've struggled. I, I remember when, when, when we start teaching this, it's like, okay, so what is it? For what is it? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. And, 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 and so what is it? What is it? Well, faith is um, acting out on God's Word. Well, what is it? I and mean, what is it? And I'm not saying I got a problem with any of that stuff, but the clearest definition of the word of faith is found here in these set of scriptures here. Are you ready? Huh? Y'all yes. still with me? You're up? Are you daydreaming? What you doing? What's, what's happening? <laughs> All right, now watch this. This is Abraham talking, and Abraham was promised, especially Sarah, I think it's Genesis 18, he says, you're going to conceive. She started laughing at him. Then it, I think God's like, are, are you laughing? No, no, I, I, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm just kind of, I'm happy. <laughs> and Abraham saying, I'm, what? I'm, I'm going to be 100 years old and, and, and have a kid? What? And then God showed up later on in Genesis and said, now I am here to fulfill what I promised. Now, I told you, uh, uh, Sarah, you're going to conceive. Now I'm here to bring it to pass. And God put something on that 100-year-old man and that 90-year-old woman. <laughs> and I tell you, there was something going on up in that tent that they ain't seen in a long time. You understand? <laughs> Viagra ain't got nothing on the anointing that was in that tent that day. I'm telling you. Nothing wasn't working, nothing wasn't living, and the life of God showed up there in that tent. All right, now watch this. So Abraham gets this, and he says, who against hope, he believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be, verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, which means there are no seeds, there's no life-giving force, it ain't working. All right. When he was about a hundred years old, and then he says, and he wasn't just a problem either, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Ain't no live eggs in there. What's going on? Watch this. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Watch the next verse, and here it is. And being fully persuaded that he had promised, he was fully persuaded that what he had promised, that what God had promised, Abraham says, I'm persuaded that what God had promised, that God was able to perform it. Did you see the dependence right there? Abraham said, he promised it, he's able. He's able. He said, this has nothing to do with me. I 
got dead stuff. Sarah got dead stuff. But he's able. So we're not depending on me and we're not depending on Sarah. We only depending on But I feel that Baptist coming up when that able. Abraham was strong in faith because he was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. So Abraham's faith was a dependence upon God to fulfill his promise. Does everybody see that? Abraham's faith was a dependence upon God to fulfill his promise. I can even go back and, 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 and fill this in. So, you know, Faith in God then, according to Abraham here, is complete dependence upon God. Complete dependence upon God. Now, go back to verse 18 and let's plug it in. Look at NLT on this one, Romans 4, 18, 21. I, I, I am now giving you an understanding of the word of faith. The word of faith is depending completely on God to do it. I don't know how we left that to any parts of you. And this is why God let this thing happen with Abraham. He needed to make sure everything was dead so nobody nowhere could take credit that you couldn't even start depending on yourself. All they know is that we feel good tonight. <laughs> All right, now watch this. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have, verse 19. And Abraham's depending on God did not weaken. Even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his depending upon God grew stronger. And when you depend on God, you bring glory to God. Ah. He depended on God, and he gave glory to God. See, I used to think that giving glory to God was thanking God. Not necessarily. When you depend on God and have complete dependence on God, that's how you give glory to God. I don't give glory to God by how loud I say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. No, I give glory to God by how, 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 how very quietly I tell you, I'm depending on God. And God says, oh, he giving me the glory. Did y'all hear that? He giving me the glory. Now watch, he said, Abraham never wavered and believed in God's promise. In fact, his dependence on God grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able. You know that old song, don't you know God is able? He's able, he's able. All right, with him. <laughs> he's able to do whatever he promises. I submit to you the understanding of the word of faith, complete dependence upon God. Now, go back and read those three scriptures real quick. Hebrews 10, 38. Now, let's plug in our understanding of this. Let's plug in our understanding of this. Hebrews chapter 10, 38, Hebrews 10, 6, 11, 6, and Romans 14 and 23. Now, the just shall live by depending on God. And if any man draws back from depending on God, my soul shall have no pleasure in him, because he's now dependent on himself. Hebrews 11 and 6. But without depending on God, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and that's not going to happen without depending on God. Romans 14, 23. Romans 14, 23. 
And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not dependent on God. For whatsoever is not of dependent on God is sin, or you're missing the mark when you decide not to depend on God. All right, now watch carefully now. Faith is an emptying of oneself. Faith is an emptying of one's self-will. Faith is an emptying of one's self-confidence. Faith is an emptying of one's self-effort. It, can, it will not be faith if, if, you're, if your self-will is there, your self-confidence is there, your self-effort is there. It is not faith. Faith, listen to this, this is huge. Faith is more than trusting God to do things ask of Him. Faith is more than trusting God to do things ask of Him. It is trusting Him to do whatever He in His infinite wisdom knows to be best, even if it is a denial of the thing you asked. Hold on a minute. Let me, let me go back. Let me go back. Faith is more than trusting God to do things you ask of Him. How many times you've asked God for me? Like, I got faith. I asked God for this. I got faith. That's going to happen. I asked God for that. I have faith. That's going to come to pass. And, and, and that's, that, that's, that's cool. I'm saying it's more than that. I'm saying we've been limited to just, I ask him to do that and I have faith for what I ask him to do. And so I have faith in his power. I, I want his power to make what I ask come to pass. He says, but when you get to understanding that it's, it's, it's a complete dependence upon God, it is now trusting him to do whatever he in his infinite wisdom knows to be best. Even, even if it is a denial of the thing that we ask for for the time being. It is asking God for your wisdom. We have faith in his power. We have faith in his power to heal us. We have faith in his power to deliver us. We have faith in his power to give us a, a promotion. We have faith in his power to protect us from our enemies. Absolutely. But he says it's got to be more than that. Do you have faith in his wisdom to know through his wisdom that this might be the best thing for you right now before you see that manifest later. We want what we want, when we want it. But God knows some of the stuff you want, you ain't ready for. So he might decide, and I know this for a fact. You might say, Lord, heal me. And by faith, I'm healed in the morning. And you wake up in the morning and it's worse. And then you keep it for another month. That's when you got to back up and say, I still depend on you. <laughs> me not getting what I want when I want it is not a sum total definition of my relationship with God. He is able to do what he said he going to do, and I'm going to trust him throughout this process. I don't understand why that's happening, why this is happening, but I do understand that I got a flashback of I got too many times where he did what he said he'll do. Now a delay, a delay is not a denial. And some of you might be in, in a delay. You don't get upset when you go to the airport. You expect to leave at 11 o'clock, and they say the flight's been delayed. You don't get upset. You just sit yourself down there, read a book, or do what you got to do, because you know eventually you're going to get on the plane, unless they cancel the flight. But even if they cancel the flight, tomorrow is coming. There's another opportunity to do something. God. I've only been taught to have faith in his power. Now he's teaching me to have, have faith in his wisdom. Yeah. Creflo Dollar, do you believe that in my infinite wisdom, I know what's best for you? Yeah, yeah Lord, but I, I really wish you'd just go ahead and do this. Yeah, I know you do, son. 
and I will, but we got to get to some stuff because I gave you some classes 10 years ago that you didn't want to take. You quit. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't finish the classes, and a lot of stuff God have you to go through, you need to go and go through it. Because you either go through it now, you might have to go through it later, but you, you, God knows what He's doing. I said, I said, say, God knows what He's doing. You got to trust Him. You will understand it better. Look at that, really didn't came up out of y'all. Bye, bye. <laughs> I was going to say later on down the line. I used to think, and I used to teach, that all illness will be healed if only the sick person has enough faith in God. If they just have enough faith in God, then all sick people would be healed. Uh, Am I denying that it takes faith to get healed? Yeah, faith takes possession of my healing. But I wanted to, in a sense, almost exalt my wisdom above God's wisdom, like he don't know what he's doing. I really started thinking about this when I ran into the Scripture in St. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. It brought up a lot of questions to my theology. St. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, look at this. We got to be careful when we get involved in those, you know, exact statements. Uh, God's got a million ways to do something. Don't try to pin him down to doing it one way. He'll open your eyes if you're blind by blowing into the next time he'll slap some mud into the next time he'll say, open up and see the next time. He, he, got, a, he got a lot of ways to do what he do. This, it, the Bible calls it the manifold wisdoms of God. All right, now watch this. This is a story about a, a, a child that was born blind. Man, if you could be in the room of that child that was born blind and hear the parents who didn't have faith in God's wisdom, why you let my child be born blind? Lord, I've been good. I'm a good person. I go to church. I pay my tithes. Like that really means something to God. It's amazing to me how people do that. I pay my tithe. Really? Well, bravo. And Jesus passed by, and he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, look what they asked. Here's this man who was blind. He's been blind since he was born. And the disciples asked him, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. See, religion had taught him there's got to be a reason for him being born blind, and it's got to be sin. Who did sin? Now, now this is what got me. The man? The man was born blind. So what, what did he sin when he was in his mama's womb or something? <laughs> well, was it his parents that he was born blind? And there are a lot of people think that same way in the church today. Oh, I must have did something for God not to do and give me the answer I wanted. Who did sin? Wow. You remember when Jesus went in these villages? He went in one village, he was able to heal everybody. He went in another village, and he wasn't able to heal nobody. And some preacher said, it's sin. Uh-uh, it was sin in both villages. One village believed the other one didn't. But look what he answered and said. Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. But the reason why this guy was born blind, so that the works of God should be made manifest in him. The New Living Translation says, so the power of God can be seen in him. I got a greater purpose for this. I appreciate y'all letting me let me, let me work through this. But my glory is going to be seen through this. Could it be that some of the answers you don't have right now is just setting you up for a future manifestation of God's glory? And can you trust that God going to do something with the curriculum you might be involved in right now? All that takes depending on God. 
I got to depend on God when things look good. I got to depend on God when things don't look good. I got to depend on God when I understand. I got to depend on God when I don't understand. I got to depend on God when I'm strong. I got to depend on God when I'm weak. I got to depend on God when I'm happy. I got to depend on God when I'm sad. I got to depend on God when I got joy. I got to depend on God when I, I'm depressed and I feel like killing myself. I got to depend on God. Why would I want to depend on God? Because he's able. He's the only one that knows how to get you up out of a ditch. I don't know how you got in those ditches or whether you're supposed to be there or not or whether you think you deserve it or not. My, my, my message this morning is, can you depend on God, both depending on his power and depending on his wisdom? And so I had to make some adjustment there because I presume to dictate to God what is best. No, God, they have faith. You, got, you need to go and heal them. How am I going to dictate to God what is, what is best? Now, this entirely ignores the fact that dependence upon God's wisdom is as important as dependent upon his power, and that's what I'm saying. We've heard a lot about depending on this power, but, you know, you just can't get over on a graveyard and say, well, you know, this child died because the parents didn't have enough faith. You know how devastating that is for somebody? Like, what? Well, this situation happened because you didn't have enough faith to... That's not right, guys. It's dependent on God, and you just keep depending on God no matter what. God knows how to raise up a situation or change a situation if you don't stop depending on it. To live by faith is not to live by sight. Somebody say, well, that's obvious. No, here's, not, here's what I'm saying. To live by faith is not to, is not to live by sight because to live by sight is to depend upon circumstances. To live by sight is to depend upon fine positions and is to depend upon your health. To live by sight is to depend upon your bank account. It's to depend upon your family and your friends. It's, it's to depend upon your connections. Now, all of these things have great value to people and believers, but to depend upon those things is to trust in them and not to walk by faith and depend upon God. Now, you got to look at your life and you got to ask yourself, how many things that I've surrounded myself with that are actually taking a place, uh, God's place. I value them more than God. I depend on them more than I depend on God. What am I depending on more than God? To depend on those other things is to live by sight. To depend on God is to live by faith. And to depend on God is grace teaching us godliness. To live by faith is also not to live according to the reason. The essence of the reason is depending upon one's own intellect. That's what happens now. I'm depending on my own intellect. I'm depending on my own reason. And I'm depending on my intellect to, to, to provide. I'm depending on my intellect to plan. Be careful that your intellect doesn't interrupt your godly living. To substitute reason for faith in God is to trust one's own intellect and to trust one's own intellectual capacity more than God's wisdom and power. I don't want to trust my intellectual capacity more than I trust God's wisdom and power. I don't care how smart I think I am. I don't care how long I've been in the ministry. I don't want to do that. Why? Because I ain't never going to be smarter than God. The just shall live by faith, and this is what it means. The just shall live by dependence upon God. Whew. Wow. I know how to live by faith now and I need grace to teach me to depend on God. I 
I need God. I need God to help me and depend on you. And that's what, that's what it looks like. It's like you say, all right, I'm going to do that. And then as soon as you move that way, then now you're dependent on yourself. You're like, God, help me to depend on you. And then you go that way, and then, you know, your intellect comes in. And you're like, God, help me to depend on you. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you start off the day perfectly dependent on God. It means you are now ready to go down this road, this journey of being trained to depend on him no matter what, which means a lot of things are going to come your way. A lot of issues are going to come your way. When, a, when trouble comes, oh, let's see, when your evil day comes, when trials come, those trials are there to help you to see and to burn off any leftover dependence upon yourself. I see that. What, and so that's why it's important not to come out of a trial without the wisdom. What should I take away from this thing I just came through? Because I guarantee you it's going to be clothed in self. You, you probably wouldn't, but a lot of people will be surprised. The people that come to churches are sometimes the most selfish people ever. And that's a journey. You have to go on a journey to be delivered from self. Depending on God is a journey. You're going to depend on God more next year than you did now, but it's a journey. And you've got to be, you can't be religious where you're ignoring how things are going. You've got to be a good judge of yourself. You've got to look in your mirror and say, I wasn't dependent on God today because if I had depended on God today, then I wouldn't have got mad. I wouldn't have got this or that. I, I, Lord, help me to depend on you. Oh, God, I said I wasn't going to complain today, and I already done complained 50 times. Oh, God, help me. It's a journey. And you know why Jesus is here? To help you with the journey. So he doesn't want you beating yourself up because you didn't do it really, really good the first day. He wants you to say, listen, now that you know what faith is and now that you know how to live by faith, start your journey on depending on me. And as you depend more on me, you're going to depend less on you. If you depend more on me, you're going to depend less on your intellect. You're going to depend less on yourself as you depend more on me. And you know what's going to start happening? When situations arise, you are now trained and dependent on God. Watch this. And you just go to sleep. Why? He got it. He got it. But some of us are not satisfied unless we can moan and moan. Moan all night long. I moaned and I moaned until I found the Lord. With the Lord, with the Lord, it wasn't lost. <laughs> and then to make yourself feel better about it, but I prayed and I prayed. Well, how long did you pray? Prayed all night long. First of all, you're lying. I know you nodded somewhere in there. <laughs> prayed all night long. I prayed and I prayed until I found somebody who wasn't lost. And then you said, I shouted and I shouted. How long did you shout? Shout all night long. No, I seen you shout in church. It didn't last but about three minutes and you was exhausted. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? If everybody in here will walk out here today with this in your mind, today I begin my journey on complete dependence upon God. You'll be shocked at the stuff that will be removed from you. You're no longer thinking about impressing people. You're no longer thinking about who's watching you. You're no longer thinking about keeping the score of, uh, you know, your Christianity versus somebody else. Self-righteousness melts away because it's now all about my journey with him. And that's what real Christianity is, my journey with him. It's not my journey in the church. It's not my journey joining the choir. It's not my, my it's, it's my journey with him. I was in Delaware this past week, and I had the awesome privilege of seeing the gospel of grace change a whole church, change a pastor and his staff as their eyes were open to it. And they said, I just don't know why I didn't see that. I'm like, same reason I didn't see it. I, I mean, 
whatever you're going through right now, I've already gone through it. I, I don't know how I could go all those years and not see it. It's not about you. It's about him. We're going to die one day, or the rapture is going to come soon. Either way, you're going to go to a place you're going to freak you out, dude. You ain't never been there before. And you want to have somebody there to kind of help you to go through this. It's going to happen. Mark my word. As it gets darker and darker in the world, it's going to get lighter and lighter in the church and with the body of Christ and with real believers, not religious people that want to just play church, that are not interested in the truth. They're only interested in self-righteousness and exalting their self-righteousness. I had some picketers in uh, Wilmington, and I was so happy that I had people picketing my meeting. I was just so happy. Taffy even told me, she says, well, I know that made you happy. I'm like, yeah, man, because I felt like when I got some picketers, I, the devil got an itch. He got a reason to try to mess with me. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, oh my God, it's about him. This is why I can come out with some jeans and a shirt and, and preach, because I'm not trying to be some pious bishop of the gospel. I ain't got no problem with people who do all that. I, I'm just saying, now that I know him for real, though, not that I know him for real, though. I know he's not, he ain't got no problem with what I wear. He ain't got no problem with my hair. He ain't got no problem with what I put on my feet. He ain't got no problem with my, you want to see my new tattoo? He ain't got no, look at some of y'all. He got, you judging me right now. You judging me. I ain't got no new tattoo. Forgive me for lying, Lord. Uh, but now that I know him, I don't, I don't feel like I need to go like that no more. And my life is a constant evaluation. All right, now, dude, you need to get on this road now. And it's okay. Y'all going to be all right. Yeah. Them people just too, too, they just too liberal. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. But Paul said to stand fast in this liberty. Okay, I got time for number two. We got eight minutes. Did y'all get the faith part there? Yes. Here's, the, here's, the, here's the awesome part right here. Here's the second thing that, that God teaches us so we can learn dependence. An emphasis upon the faithfulness of God should be a great stimulus to dependence upon him. An emphasis on the faithfulness of God. I depend on God and I depend on him being faithful all the time. Look at this scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. I'm going to just read this with you, and we'll pick up with uh, uh, sanctification and prayer next week. He says, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Say out loud, God is faithful. God is faithful. And I can depend on a faithful God. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 23. Hebrews 10, 23, I can learn this dependence upon God through this teaching of faithfulness. He wants me to know that God is faithful so that I can settle this. I can depend on a faithful God. I can depend on God because he's faithful. I can depend on God because he's faithful. He said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So every promise that I read in the New Testament, I believe I receive it right now. Why? Because he's faithful. I can depend on a faithful God. Look at Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23. Y'all sitting up here on Memorial Day weekend getting your feed on. That's what I'm talking about. Ain't no, ain't no place like no world changes ministry. Sitting up here getting your feet on. You know, if I was in a traditional church, you see that little finger a hundred times. I see y'all. I see y'all. ain't going to be no hoop in the day. Let me go. God bless y'all. But you know you can't change unless, unless you're here. This is cool right here. They are new. He's talking about his love. 
and his mercy, they are new every morning. Watch this. Great is thy faithfulness. Tell me who has a problem depending on somebody that's faithful. Even if you got a friend and you got a faithful friend, if they tell you they're going to come pick you up at 6 o'clock, you ain't got to get worried because it's easy to depend on somebody who has demonstrated the characteristic of faithfulness. Look at 1 Peter 5 and 7. Now, this is a good one. This is something that hit me. It, this is something that I am, I am working on, completely working on, continuing to work on. It, it, it's, it's my journey. Casting all your care upon him. Now, I know some of y'all got that perfect, but sometimes I be wanting to carry them cares because I'm like, you know, before I cast it on you, how you going to handle it? <laughs> Casting all your care upon him. Why? For he cares for you. You know what he's saying here? You can depend on me. You can depend on me. And, and, I, and, I, and I keep it, and then I cast it, and then I keep it, and then I cast it, and sometimes I keep it, and I don't cast it, and then I keep it, and I'm like, well, if I cast it on you, you I ain't going to die, am I? Uh, you know? <laughs> and he says, I care for you. I gave you my son Jesus. I'll give you anything. Let God's faithfulness bring us into godliness. And then the, the last one here. Proverbs 4, 19. Now, this is huge for where we're living right now. I need you to grab this today, and I need you to begin your journey with this today. Grab this today, and I need this to become something that's part of your life. Philippians 4, 19. Philippians 4, 19. I don't know what I said. Philippians 4, 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know what he's saying? And you can depend on me to supply all of your need. There is never going to be something you need in your life that God hadn't already stored the supply away. Never. It's that little trick about, well, how come I don't have it now versus, all right, now, wait a minute. Trust that uh, what I'm allowing to happen right now is the best for you. He'll supply all you need. I depend on you. I depend on you to take care of me. I'm not going to depend on the government to take care of me. I ain't depending on no senator to take care of me, depending on no president, no president, ain't nobody. I ain't depending on nobody. You better be careful. You know, stimulus checks and welfare checks and just sitting around waiting for a check. You better get a check in your spirit that God is faithful. That's what you need to get, a check in your spirit that he'll... He is your supply house. Depend on that. Depend on that. And if you are afraid and you have fear, it's like, Pastor, I hear you, but I'm afraid. I'm, I'm afraid to depend on God. Why? I don't know enough about him. He'll teach you. But let me tell you that that one time when he does something and you depended on him, the devil better go and move now, boy, because now you got something to flash back to. You got something to go back to and say, look at what God did last week. Look at what God did week before last. And now you're going to come up to the day and say, if he did it last week, and if he did it week before last, I tell you, I'm going to depend on him right now today. God knows how to train you to that point. And he's committed to, to training you to that point. Godliness, the, the spirit of grace teaches us godliness, which, com which is complete dependence on God, which means when I do that, I am giving him the glory. You want to give God the glory all week this week? Live a life dependence, depending on Him. Live a life depending on Him. Easier said, need to be demonstrated. Begin your journey today, a journey of depending on God. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to see acceleration. In fact, there is an anointing that God is about to release dealing in the area of acceleration. 
This anointing is going to take, and we've been prophesying this over, we're here now. This anointing is going to take stuff that used to take like a year and bring it down to a month. Some of y'all are going to see stuff in days. Somebody shout acceleration. Because I believe heaven, for lack of, of a better word, is, is anxious to get to going here. It's like they're, they're ready to burst. They're, that's why you, you reread scriptures about before you ask, he's already going to be sending the answer. He ready. God's ready. It's time for us to say we're ready. It's time for us to do what needs to be done. I am convinced more than ever before that the rest of all of my life is about teaching this gospel of grace to the whole world. I'm convinced. I am grateful for the technology that exists and all that other stuff. But we've got to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And God will take us. I've never, never even engaged in a one-year series. I don't even know, do I have enough to say for one year? I depend on God. By the time December come, you're going to be flowing, oh my God, with the grace of God as he's teaching you to live a life <laughs> dependent on him. You learned anything this morning? God bless you. <laughs> Lift your hands up and say this out loud with me, Heavenly Father. I make a decision today to begin my journey of complete dependence upon you. I trust you, Lord. Teach me, Lord, and I will receive from you. Thank you for the grace of God teaching me godliness, and I will walk in it with no fear at all. In Jesus' name, amen. God is good, amen. God is so good. Just for a moment, the most important thing you can do if you're not born again is to get born again. If you're here, if you can just hold the walk in just for a moment, or if you're on the line streaming in with us, I'm going to lead you into a prayer of salvation, an opportunity for you to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior. Pray this out loud with me. Heavenly Father, I realize that I'm a sinner, but right now I repent of all my sins. I receive the free gift of forgiveness, and I make you my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I receive you into my heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just pray that prayer with me over, over line, if you'll just text the keyword, I'm saved, that's one word at 51555, provide your name and email address, and we'll send you a free ebook as a gift to you today. Those of you who prayed that prayer with me here in the dome, then praise God, we'll, we're going to uh, uh, open the altar up in just a moment for you to come down, and we welcome you all to the family of God. Let's go ahead and complete our last act of worship. And that last act of worship in today's service is a giving of gifts. It's gift giving. It's gift giving to God in appreciation and thanksgiving for what he has already done. It is going to God and saying, because I value you and because of what you've done and what you are doing in my life, Father, I want to honor you and worship you with this gift. And as you prepare to give, in fact, if you need an offering envelope in the dome, if you'll raise your hands and ushers will get one to you, you uh, we'll also be providing a QR code for you to do that. You know the drill. But to me, this is the most important part because it's my opportunity to respond to everything God's been doing all week long, everything God has, has been showing, every, everything that you may have experienced for God. Just, it's an opportunity to say, Lord, thank you. Lord, I appreciate you. Lord, I honor you. You know, we use the word honor, but you got to understand honor puts God in the number one spot in your life. Honor gives God the most value of anything else in your life. And when you give financially, it's a gift to use to honor him. Somebody says that's not scripture. Matthew chapter 2, the Magi found Jesus and the Bible says they went in the tent, saw him, fell to their feet as they reached into the treasury and began to worship 
God with those gifts. And that's what we're doing now. There's something so awesome when we decide to give to God out of love, out of appreci appreciation, and out of thanksgiving. And so, let's take that opportunity to do that. Father, we thank you for this privilege of worshiping you with these gifts. I thank you that your blessing is on it, that we can just show gratitude for all that you do in Jesus' name. Let's just go ahead and receive the offering. If you're watching by stream, the four ways to give on the, sc on the screen, and there's also a QR code that you can give as well. And uh, if you have to go to work or something, there's uh, two screens by the communication desk in the lobby. You can hit that and QR code to do what needs to be done there as well. Amen. Praise God. What y'all gonna do tomorrow? Rest? Who cooking rib tomorrow? <laughs> you got some of them beans to go with it? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, enjoy, enjoy your life, man. Enjoy your life. That's important. Amen. Now, the last thing I want to do before we dismiss is those of you who are, you believe God's called you to join this church, you believe that World Changes Church International is a church for you and your family to, to come and be fed and, and for us to watch over your souls. If that's you, would you get your Bibles, person belongings, whatever you have, join me down to the altar. And what you're saying is, I am here to become an official member of World Changes Church here in College Park, Georgia. If you're online and you want to become a part of our e-church membership, you can go to worldchanges.org and click join at the top of the page. Text join WCCI, all one word to 51555, and we'll send you all the benefits of e-membership. Amen. If you're not born again or you didn't pray that prayer, come on down. We can pray it upstairs. If you did pray that prayer, come on down. We want to put some things uh, in your hands. Make sure you're good to go and square it away with everything. We want to celebrate you. We believe that everything changes with a walk to the altar. Amen? The altar is where they dedicated you as a baby. The altar is where you come when you get saved. The altar is where you come when you get married. And even when you die, they roll you to the altar. It is a place of change. Amen? It's a place of change that we, we want to open up and begin to do even more things as we get back to some, some normal things and let God be God. Amen. Let God be God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how things are looking. Everything's subject to change. You're going to be all right. Everything is subject to change. God is a good God. Amen. He's good God. Well, Father, we thank you for these men and women, and we thank you that you're going to do amazing things in their life. We agree with that now in Jesus' name. Amen. To you turn this way and follow this gentleman to the prayer room, they're going to take you and get some information for you, uh, from you, and we just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, if you'll stand for our final blessing. And this final blessing is so important. Thank you guys for sticking around long enough to get it. There are, there are some really weird things going on. These things should not be promoting fear in your heart. You should not have any fear about going and doing your shopping. The Lord will talk to you. He'll tell you what to do. You pray over your children like, you know, like we used to do. Pray over your children. You'll go in with safety and you'll come back home safety. I plead the blood of Jesus over my children, praise God. But don't let any of these things that are going on in the world right now allow you to become fixed in fear. God is greater than all these things. He will tell you what to do. There'll be sometimes you'll wake up, the Lord and say, you know, uh, uh, keep Johnny home this morning. Don't be talking about why. <laughs> Just do it, amen. Lift your hands up. May God's grace continue to teach us 
to live godly lives, to refuse ungodliness. May the power of his grace release favor upon you. May you know what it's like to receive promotion from the Lord. May you experience doors that were closed to you that will be supernaturally open to you. I declare that God is perfecting everything that concerns you and that the God of all grace will show up right on time every time. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God, be glory, dominion, and power. May the power of God protect you. May God's power through his blood keep you safe. And that if there's any virus, germ, cold, whatever touches your body, it will die instantly in the name of Jesus. I declare over your life that all is well and that you walk in the supernatural anointing of God's favor. Be blessed today and all this week is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you, everybody. Have an amazing day. You asked and we answered. We know there are friends of the ministry who prefer CDs and DVDs. But for those of you who find the digital versions of messages better fit your life, Creflo and Taffy Dollar's message series are now available as digital downloads in the CYWE store. Log on to CYWEstore.com today to see the whole catalog of new and re-release messages that can be downloaded to any device for easy and convenient listening.